Thanks for having me. Um, real honour to be in somewhere like this to, to be giving a speech to, to the likes of you guys. Um, so sort of getting ready for this, I was, I was watching all the YouTube videos, Stephen Fry and people like that had been on there. I was thinking, how on earth am I going to come in and, and give a speech, someone like myself, to you guys who are obviously the brightest minds in this country, here to hopefully make a change and make things better. And I kept thinking, like, I'm going to be rubbish, I've got nothing to give, what can I talk about? But the, the overriding thing that, that sort of hit me and I was thinking, this is really going to go badly, is what on earth do you wear when you come and speak to you guys? <laughs> so I do apologise, I'm like a, a weird mix of Ron Weasley and Steve Jobs have spat out something <laughs> with Love Child, so here I am. Um, but hopefully I can give you something from, from what I'm going to talk about. Now, I know what you're all expecting. You're, you're thinking, I've come in here, I'm a professional sports person, um, I'm going to tell you that basically I'm better than you, uh, I train harder than you, uh, I've sacrificed more than anything you could ever imagine, um, and you could never do it, because that's ultimately what we always seem to get from sports people when they talk. It's the doom and gloom of, of what is being a professional sports person. And I've decided that I don't want to go along those lines anymore. I want to I change things up slightly, because I'll be honest, I've fallen foul of that many times. You go and speak at places, they bring you in, they want you to say that, you know what, the only way to succeed is to work harder than everybody else. In actual fact, it's not true and it's probably one of the biggest myths, especially within sport, that's ever been out there. And I'm hopefully going to give you a, a bit of an idea. Now, the reason that I think most sports people do that, they want to talk about how hard it is, is probably everybody afterwards goes, oh, you, you're so good, you work so hard, poor you. It must be a hard life. And they get a bit of a, an ego massage there and they'll feel really good about themselves. Um, the other thing, most sports people are very dull. Um, and I apologise if I am dull. <laughs> I'm going to try not to be, um, but most are. So. What do they talk about? They talk about training and they tell you, yes, I do get up at 5am and, and swim in a pool or whatever else. Swimmers aren't all dull, I'm, that's just a, an example. Um, and the last one, and probably the biggest one for most sports people, and especially ex-sports people, is that generally they go to, to the end of year knees up at whatever sort of places offered them a, a spot and they get paid a nice uh, bit of money in order just to talk about being better. And hopefully they'll motivate the old person, but then they all go get drunk afterwards. Because uh, I think that is the life of, a, of an ex-sports person when you are on the circuit talking. But none of that applies here. Um, I'm actually going to be quite truthful, and especially about me and, and how I got to, to where I am now. Because I'm very fortunate I stand in front of you now. I've, I've won five major titles. That's uh, four of them. It means that I've won every title in my sport. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be a, a double European Commonwealth World and Olympic champion. Um, but it wasn't the normal journey. It wasn't what everybody would tell you is the way I won and, and the reason that I won. Because the, what I'm going to tell you isn't different to everybody else. It's just the truth. And I hope, in actual fact, by giving you the truth of what a sports person's life is like, in actual fact, it will help. And it will give you an idea of it's not actually as difficult as you think. Now, obviously, you have to be pretty talented. You do have to work hard. That, that's, that's a fact of life. I mean, blimey, I'm not going to go off and become a... <laughs> neuroscientist of some form of lobotanist or whatever. I don't know. I, I don't have that ability. I'm, I'm good at jumping. Bizarre as it sounds. I mean, I know exactly. That, that is, that's the response you generally get. I mean, my life is defined by the fact that I run in a straight line and jump into a sandpit. It's, it's bizarre, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's such a niche physical activity and one that I've been very fortunate has given me the opportunity to travel the world and, and meet some very exciting people um, and, and lead a relatively fun lifestyle. But I didn't get there by giving up absolutely everything, by training harder than anybody else. I've managed to find what is probably the perfect mix of life and performance in order to create something that for me was an environment to thrive and actually to take the natural ability that I've been very fortunate to, to be blessed with to go forward and succeed. Now life and performance is something that I, I often talk to with all my friends and everything else and sort of try and help people find that balance because I've gone to both sides of the spectrum. Now, I'll tell you two sort of smallish stories about me so you get an idea of how I've become who I am now and, and how I enjoyed life too much and then how I went far too far down the, the, the side of performance. <coughs> and the life side of things, now, I'm from a place called Milton Keynes, you've probably all heard of it, it's famous for roundabouts, etc. at its 50th birthday the other day, not an awful lot goes on there. And worse still, I'm from Bletchley, I say worse still, Bletchley's famous for Bletchley Park, Alan Turing, you guys have probably heard of him. Um, 
from World War II, obviously, and Bletchley is still famous for Alan Turing and Bletchley Park. <laughs> Nothing particularly happens in Bletchley. Um, so as a youngster growing up, I decided that I'd mix up with my, my friends and I would, I would enjoy myself a lot. I would do all the things that young guys, I guess, especially when they roam the streets, having a bit of fun, being a bit naughty, would do. Uh, and I decided that one day I'll be good at sport, but while I'm young, I'll just lead this life of enjoying my life and, and, and actually just doing whatever I really fancy <coughs> doing. Now, I was lucky enough to be good at sport. I participated in a lot of sport. I never particularly trained for sport because every time I tried a sport, I became okay at it. I was never the gre greatest, I was never the best. I just became pretty good. So I thought, you know what, sport's pretty easy, so I'll just enjoy myself a lot. Now, I used to roam the streets a lot. In my mid-teens, I then started drinking a bit. I was your, your typical chav, if you like. It's, a good, it's, it's the perfect, perfect example. I mean, a good example of that is one day I went into London thinking Burberry scarves are very cool. Walked into the Burberry shop and realised that they cost an awful lot of money for, for somebody like myself. So I could never quite be your, your true chav. Um, I was never fully accepted, but I tried hard. Um, so I would, I would roam the streets, I would drink, I would have a lot of fun. I would trespass, I'd get chased by the police security guards, whoever it was, because I enjoyed that thrill, the, the chase and the idea of potentially being caught for me was something that I've always really enjoyed. I've, I've loved living on the edge slightly and, and doing things that are a bit dangerous. So if I was on my bike, I would, how many stairs can I jump before I break something? Because I've got to find out, because that's going to be really good fun. <laughs> and as I got older, that started to, uh, to, to manifest itself into something that became fundamentally quite dangerous. All of a sudden, you have, in my case, an older brother. He has friends that drive, and obviously cars are, are, are fun toys, aren't they? You can, you can do a lot of very good things in a car, like car surfing, in my case. Now, I'll explain what car surfing is, and we, we dubbed it car surfing. I don't think it's actually an official sport yet, um, <laughs> sadly. What, what car surfing involves is uh, basically you laying on top of a car, arms spread wide, chest down, facing forwards, you're the driver and the passenger winds down the windows, you hold on, the driver then accelerates to, in our case, speeds are probably excess of 50 miles an hour, down the beautiful country B roads of, of, of England, um, and you hold on for dear life. And for me, that was always a wonderful thing, what an exciting, I mean, what, what, what more fun can you have at 15 when you're on top of a car and, and risking your life? I mean, it's, it's clearly the best thing to be doing as any budding sports person should be doing. But there was this one moment, and, and this one moment that, that took place for me, which actually changed everything entirely. And if it wasn't for car surfing, I don't actually know whether or not I would have had that, that realisation. And, and it all came from laying on top of it. By the way, never do it. It's very stupid, like very stupid. I'm very worried. I'm, I'm sort of smiling as I talk about car surfing, and it's, it's, not, it's not a wise thing to do. So I'm laying on top of the car. My brother's friend driving, my brother in the, the passenger seat, me and my friend Ross as well, because we sometimes do it as tandem, I mean, there's two of you on top of it. Obviously much safer when there's two of you. So we're laying there, and I'll never forget this sensation that I had. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm looking down the road, it's getting dark, and I'm seeing a, a really large oak tree just protruding out this, from the side of the road. I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden, it's, I'm, I'm sort of having some weird out-of-body experience. I'm, I'm seeing myself, but I'm seeing myself come off of the car hit the tree and be this crumpled mess on the floor. And, it, and it, was, it, was, it was bizarre, and I can still sort of feel it now. It was as if it just, it was happening, it was about to happen. So all of a sudden, from the laughing, ah, oh, this is great, I'm having the best time ever, I froze. I remember looking forward, staring at this tree. My brother looked up at me, are you all right? Couldn't speak. All of a sudden, in some form of high-pitched squeal, I just said, stop the car, stop the car now. They thankfully pulled over. You know, you, some people have mates that would carry on going and find it hilarious. <laughs> I got off the car, jumped in the back. Everybody laughed, oh, you're a wuss, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff as you do. Yeah, yeah, it's funny, it's funny, funny. Inside, though, there was this pure panic because not only had I foreseen myself potentially killing myself, all I could think about was the fact that the sporting talent that I potentially had would never, ever have a chance to flourish unless I got off that damn car and actually started taking my life a bit more serious. And that, funny enough for me, was a turning point. So all of a sudden, I've been doing all these stupid things, drinking, smoking, stealing co-op nine pound earrings. I always remember them, they're nine pounds. And to me, back in about 97 or whatever that was, that was uh, a good bit of gold that was. Um, a chav, I know it was terrible. Um, and all of a sudden I was like, do you know what? I'm gonna, 
I'm going to change this now. And I'm actually going to start being a bit more serious. I'm going to be an athlete that actually trains a bit more often. I mean, I'd sometimes turn up to training drunk, I'll be honest at times, I, I, that I had been known to do that. Um, I never took it seriously. This moment made me realise, you know what, actually, you have to give it a go, have to try. Hitting a tree is not an option. Don't try and hit a tree. So I stopped, so I changed. So all of a sudden, I've gone from this idiot who's driving around on, on top of cars, to now I'm training a bit more often. Now I'm training probably three times a week at this point. I've joined a new coach, a new training environment. I'm training out of, uh, of Eton, um, which you guys, if any of you have done trekking field, have probably been down there. Nice little setup. Three times a week, as I say, I'm getting better. For 18 months after that point, all of a sudden, I'm getting much better. So I'm not just the guy now who's making up the numbers. All of a sudden, I'm winning the odd thing. So I'm 18, and I'm now world number one in my event. I'm a European champion. I'm the British junior record holder. And I'm thinking, this is it. I've made the turning point in my life. I'm becoming a serious athlete now. Now I will go and I'll win everything. So what do you do at that point? As most people in this country will tell you, you have to train harder. You keep training harder and harder because the only way to be better than the Americans, the Jamaicans, or the best in this sport is to train harder than they train. So people can see what they've done online. Just double that. Let's just do more than they do and you will become the best in the world. So we move away from the life now and all of a sudden, <coughs> 2006, seven comes along and I start moving way down the spectrum to, towards performance, right literally as far as you can get away from life. So I'm now training six days a week. I'm working exceptionally hard. I'm doing everything that I'm told is the right way to perform, and the right way to succeed in sport. Because as you said, sports people come up here, they'll tell you that they train harder than everybody else, sacrifice everything and never lead a life. And I tried that. I joined a coach who loved that side of it as well, just wanted to work you harder and harder. Having massive cramps and little injuries, they weren't particularly a problem because you're working hard. It's making you strong. We're British, we've got to be strong with these sorts of things. It doesn't work. But because I was told it was the right thing to do, I stuck with it. I became more and more unhappy with my life and what I was doing. Lo and behold, I get to 2008. I'm get, trying to get ready for an Olympic Games. I'll be totally honest, in the February I started looking for a job. I was hating athletics so much because all I was doing, getting injured, working hard, having no life, not enjoying myself at all. And I didn't want to continue. So we get to an Olympic Games. I make the final first round. It's great. My first Olympics, I'm 21. Feeling like, do you know what, I have a chance here. I get into that final, go into complete meltdown. I surrounded myself with a team that sadly doesn't really know what to do in those moments. And I get knocked out in 10th. And you might think, oh, you finished 10th in the Olympics, that's great. When you give up everything for something, that's like you going for a job interview for the, your dream job and nine other people going in ahead of you and them just going, you're not good enough. That's exactly how it is. It's heart rendering. You, you're just devastated at that point. So I had to take a, a, a good look at myself and, and talk to people around me that were, were close to me and start to realise, do you know what, in actual fact, the years before, when I was enjoying myself a bit and training a bit, mixing them up together, I actually had a good time. So what do I do? I went on the hunt for the perfect coach and I'm very, very lucky in 2009, probably the greatest track and field coach of all time, a man called Dan Paff, who is still my coach to this day, was brought over to the UK to work with British Athletics. I was able to ask if he would coach me. He did. So I've got the right coach. Medical team, I've had a lot of injuries. The guy came over called Jerry Ramajita, fantastic Canadian chiropractor. I got him on board. A guy called Andy Burke, a, a Welshman who'd, who'd worked within the sport for a long time, got him on board. What I did is I created an environment for me to become better. But what I didn't stop was the enjoyment side of what I was doing. Now, I wasn't car surfing again, obviously. I wasn't going out drinking all the time, all that sort of stuff. So what I did is I found things that I enjoyed. And nowadays, that, that is traveling. That's, that's seeing different parts of the world, which I have seen a lot of, and I've been very lucky to. I love coffee. I'm borderline obsessed with, with, with coffee and what goes on with that. I know it's very sad, I do realize. Um, but these little things that I could now actually channel this enjoyment side of things, put it into that rather than the destructive side of it, and create what is the perfect environment for me to succeed. Now, in the UK, a lot of people don't do that. What they'll do is they'll find a coach, they'll find a person, they'll find a team, and they'll stick with that because they think, well, it will get better. You have to be prepared to make those changes when you realize it's not working because nobody is gonna enjoy 
a dead end scenario where in actual fact, it's just the same repetitive thing. It's never a good place to be. Thankfully, within me, I made those changes. And for three years, I worked on this team. I worked hard with them. We did everything we needed to do. I trained less, probably trained four days a week. I enjoyed myself, be it with the new things that I'd found that are enjoyment side of things. And all of a sudden, August the 4th, 2012, I find myself standing in the Olympic Stadium. I've just watched as Jessica Rennes has, has crossed the finishing line after finishing her 800 metres, arms aloft. The crowd whipped into a frenzy beyond belief. Then my name comes up on the scoreboard. It's my turn to jump again. I'm leading the Olympic final. I've just watched Jess, as I say. All I wanted at that point, I wanted to be Jess for a minute. I wanted to experience what it must feel to win an Olympic title because it's the holy grail of, of, of Olympic sports. You become an Olympic champion. That is the dream realised. I'm leading. I stand on there with all of this going through me. I go through the normal conversation with myself. I've done this a thousand times. I know what I'm doing. Just execute on the runway. I run down the runway, strike the board. The crowd has been going absolutely mental as I'm running down. The closer you get to the board, the louder they got. I take off and with a splash of sand at the end, I performed the Olympic winning jump in round four of London 2012. And all of a sudden, I started to realise the dream that I'd had. And it wasn't down, down to the fact that I'd worked harder than anybody else. <coughs> Arguably, there was more talented people in that room, in that stadium. But for me, I put together what works for me. I created a team that was the winning formula to bring out everything within me in order to succeed. I maintained that team. I then went on to win the, the many titles and medals that I have done now. So what I'd hope you can get from that is that if you can be, not cutthroat isn't the right, right words, but if you can be staunch in your approach to whatever walk of life it is and find the right people that enhance you and enjoy everything that you do within that, you will succeed to whatever level you wish to succeed. You just have to make those decisions and make them early. And I hope all of you can actually find some level of of solace in everything you do and enjoyment because without the enjoyment, you truly do not ever succeed. So I hope that helped. I was just trying to, trying to keep it relatively brief for you guys because I didn't want to go into a too long, boring conversation. But you don't have to work as hard as, as, as you think. You don't have to kill yourself and you don't have to hate what you do to succeed. Find the enjoyment, find the right environment and you'll go on and do what you want to do. Cheers. <laughs>
you said that it's probably the best day of your life until potentially the time when you marry and the, your baby is born. How did that compare to Susie giving birth to Milo? Um, well, I had a different girlfriend back then as well, so... Um, <laughs> um, no, I, and, I, and I've come out to say it since I, my son is by far the most important thing in my life, by a long, long way. And jumping into sand is very secondary um, to, to being with my son. I, I'm, I love being a dad, like, I can't explain it. It's, it's, yeah, it's borderline obsession. I have so much fun all the time. I think because I am a big kid at heart all the time, I get to be that big kid now for a long time while Milo develops. Um, so we have a good time, but no, being a dad for me is far more important. And I hope I'm remembered more for, especially within my family, obviously, for being a good dad than just a, a man that jumps in sand. And talking about your own family, when you were a child, I understand that things weren't always easy and straightforward. Um, what was your relationship with your family? You spoke a lot about your team, but what well, influence did your family have? On you? Yeah, my family were a huge part of that team. Um, and, it, and it's probably wrong with me. It's very easy to forget your family because they're always an entity that, that's there. Often. I mean, for somebody like myself, I'm very fortunate uh, to have two parents who were always there and always supportive. Um, I think the problem we had, as I mentioned, what, when I was a youngster, um, I was difficult at times. And there, that was probably lashing out due to multiple different things that were going on. Um, and just the, the typical fiery redhead, like I just couldn't, I couldn't accept anything. I had to always question everything and I always had to find an answer. And I think often that can cause a, a lot of tension. But in actual fact, the people who have been there from start to finish has been my family. They were, they were there in the Olympic Stadium when I won. They were there in the Olympic Stadium when I didn't um, in 2008. Um, sadly, couldn't make it over to Rio, but um, they are the, the, the one cornerstone, if you like, that you can always rely on, I think. And I think it's very important that um, you find people like that, because not everybody obviously has a family. That's, that's the one thing, but you find people, that team that, that will always keep you on the straight and narrow. I'm sure they, they wanted you to win 2012, and you did, and con congratulations Thank on that you. once again. But sh uh, how did you feel, you know, the moment afterwards? Did you feel that now that you've succeeded, what, you know, did you question what's next? Um, no, for me it was a funny one. I think because I was fortunate to win at 25. Um, so for me, I knew I still had a few years left where I could continue to go on and hopefully win some more championships. Um, I think it was very unexpected when I did win. I mean, unexpected from probably everybody looking in, not, not unexpected by um, my team. Again, that the team that I always refer to, coach, etc. We'd worked hard to get to that point and done the right things in order to get there. Um, so all I wanted to do straight after it was, was do it again, because there's this strange addictive moment when you stand on a podium, especially when you've won, and it's all about you again at the moment. I know that probably sounds like a really sort of self-centered way of looking at it, but it's hugely addictive. You, your, your achievement is, is finite, it's there, you've done it, you get given a medal, there's something, something tangible about that moment that you can now hold on to and, and, and sort of show if you like. And it is those moments that I've had difficulties in my careers, as mentioned, that all of a sudden it's worked. It's, it's the right thing. I've got to the right place and I've won. And you want to win more and more. Uh, I've been very fortunate that in my <coughs> career I've managed to do that. And then in 2016, there was a, a big um, scandal with doping and everything mm. else. And obviously today Usain Bolt has just lost one of his gold mm. medals because of his teammates, uh, Nesta Carter's positive test. Mm -hmm. What do you make of doping and how would you solve the problem? I think I've been very outspoken in the way that <laughs> I, I find it, uh, I think it's disgraceful for, for people that, that do dope. Um, I think the processes aren't quite in place yet actually to, to eradicate and I don't think it will be for a very long time. I think we have a problem with certain countries as we've seen with state doping in, in Russia. Um, it's now and impossible for people to get in there to actually make true change I think at the moment because the mindset has to change before the process is going to change, and I don't think that's, that's happened yet. Um, I think with what we ha now have with, with Lord Coe in place, I think that's a fantastic person to have at the, the head of the IWF. Um, and I think there are a few people now that are really working hard on it. But you've got to think, w every time a person cheats, especially at major championships, what you do is you take away from that person that, in athletics, 12 people make a final. If you find out subsequently that the person that won or the person that finished fourth has failed for, for drugs, that person in 13th never had, never had their chance. 
and then that person that finished second because the, the, the winner cheated, they never had that moment that I know what that feels like. And, and as I say, it's very hard to put into words how incredibly special that is. And the idea of taking that away from other people, I think, is disgusting in my opinion, and so incredibly wrong. But often people don't look at it like that. They just think, well, other people are probably cheating, I'll cheat, um, and it's fine. It's, it's not. I really hope that at some point soon we get to a point where everybody's tested far more often. Um, everybody who has cheated previously is found out and removed. Um, and we get to a, a point where it's impossible for people to cheat. But sadly, I think what we saw post Balco, when, if everybody remembers the, the sort of Marion Jones saga and, and Tim Montgomery, which happened there uh, about 10 years ago now, um, Victor Conte, the, 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 the sort of scientist behind it, he always said he'll be one step ahead. And that's the issue that we face. And I really hope that they can bring in the right people in order to, to eradicate it entirely. Because it's something that a lot of us are very passionate about and it needs to stop. So if you can't eradicate it, you obviously have to punish. Absolutely. What would, what would your regular punishment be? Well, I still believe in a lifetime ban. The only issue I have with it at times is sometimes young athletes get drawn into a scenario where everybody around them, the people, as I mentioned, my team who were incredible for me, sometimes people surround themselves with the wrong team and they will be actively pushing them, be that your agent, coach, people around you, ex-athletes, pushing you into a scenario where you're advised to cheat. And I'd feel very, I do genuinely feel sorry for, for young athletes, sort of in their late teens, early 20s, who, who don't know any better um, and th then have it pushed upon them. But sadly, they have to be the casualties in a world where we completely remove it. So a lifetime, lifetime ban, or if you can't impose that due to legal reasons, then you, removing anybody who's ever cheated from an Olympics would start hugely to stop it. Because you've got to think, athletes generally live off of the fact that there's a chance of winning an Olympic medal. If you win an Olympic medal, financially, it's a, it's a, it's a benefit to you, obviously. You go and compete in, in the championships or the events the following year, people will pay for you to be there. Now, if you remove the chance of people winning Olympic medals, they're not going to want to cheat because it's not worth it. Financially, they'll be completely and utterly ruined. And another issue with 2016 Olympic Games was to do with location. Mm. And many question the, the choice of Brazil. How do you rate Brazil as an option and would you give it to similar uh, cities in the future? I think it's a very difficult one. Now, the, the, thing, the problem Brazil had in part was the fact that London was so good. And before that, we had a Games in China, which was run incredibly well. Um, I think Brazil struggled due to the fact that the, the, the huge financial weight of, of hosting. First of all, we've got to think a World Cup two years before the Olympics. Um, and it pushed them to, to the brink of, of implosion, as we've sort of seen now with everything having to change. Um, a rising economy, I don't think, is the right place to be hosting something like that. I understand exactly why they did it, to try and obviously boost it in, the, in, in South America and obviously show there's a chance for countries like that to, to get it. But if it causes more harm than good, um, and we saw that places weren't finished, uh, it was a bit of a nightmare to get around as well. Um, and it seemed a lot of the locals really didn't want it there, which was, which was really, really sad. The funniest thing about the Olympics in Rio is us as the athletes, it didn't feel like an Olympics. There's this, there's this weird sensation you have when you're at an Olympics, this anticipation for what is, again, the pinnacle of sport, if you like. And it wasn't there in Rio for, for most people. It, it felt like just another meet. And I think that's very sad. When you get to that level, something's missing. And I, and I think, and again, it wasn't the fault of Rio. I, 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 th I feel as if possibly um, they just took on too much too soon. Right. And now that we are slowly moving into politics, let me <laughs> read a line to you. On 24th of June 2016, you tweeted, I'm going to bed in a country that might put Trump in charge <laughs> after watching Britain do the unbelievable. <laughs> Naughty world. Stop it. Down. What are your feelings now about everything that happened? <laughs> Clearly, I have a career in politics after, after that tweet. Um, it's a bizarre world, isn't it? The pr problem is well, I Trump one, so can you. Well, <laughs> there you go, yeah. Maybe actually what I was saying, that anybody can do anything you want, really. I mean, that's, that's probably what that's shown. Um, I think, sadly, I'm not versed enough in the ins and outs of uh, the American political world in order to... Uh, 
to have a true and honest opinion, but I, I think the things that we've seen are obviously very worrying um, for multiple reasons. Um, and I think the marches that took place were obviously a fantastic show of strength of people that are very opposed to something that I think is going to be an interesting four years. Surely you can't go for, for eight. I mean, that'd be unbelievable. But no, it, the thing is for me, I spent a lot of time in America and I think what was, what was very odd about that and around the time that I, I posted that, I'd been talking to the people that were, I rent a house every time I go to America and I sort of take over the family. The people that owned the house, they had a book about Donald Trump in their house. And I was like, oh, are you a Trump supporter? They said, oh, absolutely not. No, no, he's, he's a bit of a clown, really. We just sort of for business point of view, like obviously he's done incredibly well, so we read a, the business book on him. But they were saying, no, no, there's, there's no chance he'll, he'll ever win. And I think that's what a lot of people thought. And it's now happened. So we have to obviously live with what's going what's gonna to come over the, the next few years. Right, and let's talk about your other political stance. <laughs> oh, no. uh, so you you signed in 2014 the open letter to the people of Scotland yeah. uh, being against Scottish independent, independence. Yeah. Um, what is the main reason behind your willingness to do that? <sighs> we should have prepped me more before we went into this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think from my point of view, and I think from a lot of people's point of view, we saw it as a as a breakup that couldn't be self-supported at that time. Um, now, obviously, now what we've seen with Brexit, I think possibly that, that might come along again. Um, but it felt like it was strange. I think for anybody who's obviously not from a particularly political background, as I'm not, it felt like a bizarre breakup just off of the, the basis of we don't particularly like you anymore, we just want to move on. And I think that was, it all felt incredibly rushed. And as I say, I'm not obviously versed enough within the world of politics to, to know the ins and outs. But I think politics is in a strange place where it's generally mudslinging most of the time anyway. And I think when it gets to something as important as trying to create a whole new country based upon historical views that people don't agree with, and the fact that you know, obviously there's been occupation, etc. I find that, that that seemed to be very, very quick. Now, obviously, within the scenario of Brexit, who knows what's going to happen? And maybe we should all be buying property in, in Glasgow now. Um, but who knows? And, and, that's, and that's the strange thing. And, and you know, I don't know what my view would be if they decided to, to go with it again now. I think it would be different. And I think I'd probably spend more time as well um, getting more involved with, with exactly the reasoning behind it, of course. And now on to Strictly Come Dancing. <laughs> uh, Politics is Strictly, of course. <laughs> Seamless. What was your motivation behind joining that show and how did you feel being eliminated before Ed Balls? In the <laughs> <laughs> um, with regards to the show, for me, I knew I was going to take a long break after, after the Olympics. I needed to take a long break. I needed to switch off from, from what had been a very, very intense period in my life again. I was going into the Olympics as a defending champion, obviously, and there's, there's added pressures, which I actually enjoy. I really enjoy the added pressure, and I enjoy people <coughs> putting a target on my back, um, and I want to always win. And there, there was never a question of I couldn't win it, and I still believe I should have won in Rio. Um, sadly, scenario wasn't quite right with an injury at a bad time, etc. But it's excuses. I didn't win on the day, and, and that was a problem. So what I found I could do in agreeing strictly was was move away from track for a while, rather than just do nothing, sit at home, dwell on the fact that I hadn't done what I hoped to, to do in Rio. I could actually try something new, try a new skill. And, and dancing is exceptionally difficult. I was talking to some of the guys beforehand. Um, and in actual fact, what I thought was gonna be a, a relatively, not easy, but a sort of a bit different, but it would be fine. I mean, I train, it's easy. In actual fact, 10, 12 hours a day every day um, to then go and compete, basically, for what was it, nine weeks in front of 10 million people each time. Now, I think, again, bigger crowds at Olympics, more people watch, but still, I hadn't exactly <coughs> trained for 15 years to be a dancer. And as you probably could all tell that I hadn't trained at all ever to be a dancer. Um, but it was, it was something that I'm fascinated by new challenges. And I like the idea of just because you do one thing, it doesn't mean that that will define you forever. And, and I truly believe that. And I've tried other sports. I, I was talking to, again to, to another guy here who tried the Skeleton Bob. I've tried that, really enjoyed it. Um, got offered a chance to go and work with the British Skeleton Bob team. Um, had a bizarre thing happen within American football where, I mean, it's a relatively long story, but it ended up being somebody putting the proposition of me training for two years to try and join the NFL. 
So the, these things are, are interesting scenarios that you find yourself in. And I like the idea of trying new things. I don't always want to be the guy that jumped into sand. Like it's, it'd be ridiculous. Like it, it, there's got to be more to life than just the one thing you choose as a youngster. And I'm fortunate enough that I'm 30 now. Um, I'm hoping I've got a couple of years left in me. And possibly by the end of that, I might try and change and try something new. What's your next goal, Tune? Absolutely, this year is, is a very, very big year for us. Um, it's a World Championships in London, the first World Championships in London. Um, it's back in the Olympic Stadium, that moment that I talked about when I had 82,000 people watching as I became an Olympic champion, I had the chance to do that again. Um, slightly smaller crowd as they've removed a bit, but um, back in London again. And for me to retain my world title after failing to retain my Olympic title would be hugely special. But on top of that, talking about trying new things, um, I'm going to revert back to sprinting a bit as well. I'm going to attempt to run quite fast, put it that way. I'm not going to put a time on it. Um, but I'm going to attempt to run quite fast. I used to be quite quick when I used to, used to give it a go. I was a world top 10 as a junior in the 100, as well as being world number one in the long. So I'm going to attempt to run fast. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Greg. My and pleasure. I now encourage you all to ask your questions. In order to do so, please raise your hand and wait for one of the committee members to pass the microphone over to you. Ideally, non political would be <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> well, let's see what happens. First question. Yes, right, last row, right all the way down. Back. Perfect. <coughs> um, I wrote a couple of things down, so forgive some reading off the screen. But um, so I've been involved in uh, a couple of professional rugby environments, so quite briefly, and um, a couple of my friends have been involved sort of full time while I was still studying here. And they become quite sort of disillusioned with it, as was I, because essentially, you know, like you said earlier, so that what was half a joke about most sports people being quite dull, it kind of resonated with me quite a lot because right. the little time I spent with a lot of like academy rugby players, topics tend to revolve around the same sort of ideas of conversation. And so I thought, you know, changing the environment is a brilliant idea. And I think, you know, massive, en enormous credit to you, I think almost more than your athletic achievements for being able to recognise that and to change it but obviously it's more difficult in mm. a team environment where things are more fixed and you have sort of more hoops to jump through essentially and you have less individual agency and so I think what I wanted to ask is if you were in a situation where you were not just part of a sort of coaching team but part of a playing team as well would there be anything that you could advise in terms of being able to do something different and kind of express yourself as an individual in that sense? Absolutely yeah I think the biggest thing that everybody always forgets is the fact that Every single person on a team, albeit in my case the individual, we are individual people. And, and this is where th this idea of, of getting the best out of each person is lost. And, and I experienced it again during my career, people saying, well, this person did this, so maybe it will work for you. I think that happens a lot in, in team sports. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's a mindset that needs to change as well. And that, that's, I think, a lot through education and actually through the athletes and sports people themselves speaking up a bit more I think the, the problem is the reason I think a lot of athletes get the, uh, the sort of uh, the tag of being dull is because you never say anything they never speak up they never actually voice their opinions and until people start doing that on mass things aren't going to change and I think rugby is a good example of that because obviously as we know rugby is a relatively new professional sport if we look at certain other sports out there so you're going to have a lot of the, the the old world coaches and and mindsets uh, behind how to succeed, where in actual fact, when things become professional, it changes hugely. Um, and until education is, is better amongst coaches, and until I think athletes are prepared to, to actually speak out and, and not fear the repercussions of that speaking out, um, I think things are always very much stunted. Um, so it's about taking the person on as the individual person. Okay, you might not be able to lift as, as much as X person, but you might be better at this. How do you work on people's positive natural abilities and actually enhance them to become a better athlete in that way in a sporting sense? Um, it's not one size fits all. And it's, it's, it's changing that through education, I think, which is hugely important. Great. Next question. Perfect. Just front row over here. I hope you've got your Fitbit on. You're going to do some steps yeah. now. Thank you. Thanks for coming again, Greg. Um, 
So I was wondering, like, when you won the Olympics in 2012 and many people commented on how your jump of 831 wasn't as high as some other um, Olympic finalists had, mm -hmm. Olympic gold medalists had jumped in the past. Do you think that kind of spurred you on um, in the future, knowing that you had earned your place as a gold medalist and you had won? Um, did it kind of inspire you more, like people kind of saying, well, should we really take him that seriously? <laughs> <laughs> It's a good way of putting it, yeah. Um, well, after the, probably the, the talk that I gave at the beginning, maybe people shouldn't have taken me that seriously. But um, no, do you know what? This is the, the fascinating thing where people get obsessed with times, distances, etc., especially within track and field. Actually, do you know what? It works across any sport. If you win the major championships, that's all that really matters. That's all that people care. And I would like to think in 30, 40 years' time, people aren't going to remember me as the guy who... I mean, what was it, five Olympics, the shortest distance to win in since whatever it was. Um, I'd like to think they'll just remember it as winning an Olympic title because fundamentally, jumping big distances, running fast times, scoring X amount of tries, goals or whatever else, they can happen anywhere. But on the day of competition, if you are the best, you win. And that's what a championships is all about. Now, obviously, I would love to have, have jumped something huge and it been a historical point, but in actual fact, to be the first Olympic gold medalist in the long jump since 1964, to me was quite a big deal. And <coughs> to, you know what, to jump 831 in a final, I'm pretty happy with that. Mm -hmm. And I think I will, I will rest well with that. Um, and you know what, people that have, have come before me, some are quite vocal. Um, yeah, that's, I've got to be careful what I say about certain other people. Um, but, yeah, I, I think, as I say, when you make a, a championships, you should never ever think about trying to create the perfect performance. The winning performance is the perfect performance for that day. And as long as you can come out winning as I did, I wouldn't really care if I'd have jumped five metres, to be totally honest. It meant that I won. <laughs> Was it also really special being part of Super Saturday and kind of all the glory of Mo Farah and Jess Ennis and you all winning one day? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, ultimately, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in now, I think if I'd have won on any other night, I was lucky enough to be sandwiched between two of Britain's greatest ever athletes. And that's a really brilliant thing for me to be involved with because they would have won on their night. And then if I would have won the following night, it still would have been remembered for their night. Now, I'm generally remembered as the, guy, the other guy, um, but that's brilliant. I'm, I'm so pleased to be remembered as the other guy than the guy that's not remembered at all. And Super Saturday is currently the defining moment in my career, and probably always will be. Um, we'll never probably in our lifetime see another Olympics in London. So from that point of view, very, very special. And I'm very thankful that Jess and Mo exist as humans, because if not, it would never have been Super Saturday. Perfect. Next question. Uh, yeah, so just six bro over here. Thank you for coming to talk. As part of Team GB, how well did you know all the other athletes? And was there any friction when some of you won and some of you didn't? And as an extra <coughs> question, what's your favourite type of coffee? <laughs> um, quite enjoy Bolivian coffee, actually, bizarrely. Like, it was a good designation um, about four years ago or so that was, that was really on point, actually. Um, anyway, uh, sadly, that's all gone now, but... Um, do you know what? There's never, there's, never a, there's never a dislike or a distaste, I guess, for other people succeeding within Team GB. Now, a lot of people ask, obviously, do we all know each other? Are we friends, etc.? Now, most of the time, unless you're at a Commonwealth Games or an Olympics, you never see <coughs> the other sports. Um, track and field is its own entity, so we will compete at World Champs, which is just track and field, European Champs, just track and field, etc. Um, so often you don't see them, and obviously when you are in Olympics or Commonwealth, you only see them for a very short period of time. Now you get to know some people um, because you might see them at events or whatever else, or some people are fortunate enough to train at the same venues. Um, but you don't really get to know that many people that well. You, you keep it really within your own sport. But there is never a sense of, that I've ever experienced anyway, of, of distaste or dislike for other people succeeding. What was quite good for me, I think, I, I was on the first two days of athletics in London especially, and we flew in from Portugal. We were held in a, a holding camp out there beforehand to be away from the, the sort of the madness of the press at that, at that time. Um, and I watched a little bit on, on the TV because we had the live feed. Now without commentary, which I think is quite nice. And you just saw people winning. 
and it really filled you with this desire to replicate that. Um, and that's what I took from it every time. I've never seen people, I mean, there's obviously people who don't like each other. I mean, blimey, the other long jumpers probably didn't want to see me win. Um, like I wouldn't want to see, see them win, but there's never, a, there's never a dislike about it, I don't think. It's generally, you wish well on your, your fellow Team GB teammates. And in my case, I take a, um, a level of satisfaction out of watching other people succeed because I always want to replicate it. Okay. One more. <laughs> Uh, just second row over here. <coughs> yeah, gentlemen over here. Uh, yeah, thanks again for giving a fantastic talk. Um, so in the past sort of 10 to 15 years, uh, some sports, uh, the British setup for some sports, um, they've really sort of started to dominate, um, think about cycling in particular. Absolutely. Um, we haven't seen the same kind of explosion of medals for the British team in athletics. Mm. Um, do you think there are lessons to be learned there for us? Is it a different sport and they're not comparable? Or <coughs> yeah, or I think, I think, it's, think, it's, I think it's nigh on impossible to compare the likes of rowing, cycling and athletics. The, the problem you've got to think with athletics is that it involves the entire world. So every single country in the world will field a team for the track and field at the Olympics. Whereas, and it's never taken anything away from it because these guys scientifically, etc., are so advanced, especially within the UK for, for your cycling. Right? There's just, just not as many people that get involved with it. Um, and that would be probably because of the financial constraints that, that other countries will have. I mean, trying to have a velodrome or the right boats, the right bikes, etc. cetera, um, I think obviously is very difficult. So th they're not comparable at all. Uh, I think winning medals in track and field, and obviously I'm slightly biased because I do it and I've done it. I, I think winning medals in track and field is very special and it's special because it's rare and it's rare because there's so many people that do it. And you could be from the smallest island in the Caribbean and you go out there and you're the fastest person in the world or from a smallish island, be it Jamaica, and be the greatest sprinter of all time. But you're never going to see a bike and you're never going to get in a boat in that way. And, th and that's, again, never taking anything away from it because they work like, I mean, talking about people that work hard. I mean, I, I've witnessed rowers destroy themselves. It's incredibly difficult, um, but it's not comparable, I don't think. What do you think British athletics could be doing then? Oh, there's a lot they could be doing. Um, <coughs> um, definitely could be an awful lot they could be doing. But I think we're probably still far more advanced than a lot, a lot of the other countries around the world. Now, the other thing you've always got to think about is it's a numbers game hugely and it's an environment game. So collegiate system in the US, I think in certain places, is a fantastic way of creating sporting excellence. First of all, being good at sport is a big deal there. If you're good at sport, they love it. And I think in the UK, We've created this, I've got to be careful again what I say, because when I go, in, go into schools and talk about it, I'm always trying to encourage people who are good at sports, because what we seem to find nowadays is that if you're good at sports, you're considered, I don't know, it's, it's this weird sort of jock mentality. I think they fear that anybody who's good at sport is going to go on to become a really arrogant, horrible person and put down the intellectual. So we've, we've sort of buried sporting prowess in the UK in, in a lot of ca cases, whereas in the US, it's not like that. So you're good at sport, you're, you're, you're made great. Cuba, for example, is a relatively small nation that has nothing. They create some of the best jumpers, the best boxers. They have nothing, but sport is hugely important. So I think we need to change culturally in this, in this country, actually what it means to be good at sport and, and how we, we get behind people like that. We've seen it in the press. It'd be great one day, the following day, they hate you and they want to bring you down. What I always find fascinating in, in places actually like, you know, Australia's relatively similar. In America, I'll go there, I've got friends who do track and field and they refer to me and it's really it's so American, but they'll go, hey champ, right. And so what's really interesting about that, now that, that, they only say that to people that have done well in whatever they, they do. And they, they celebrate every single person that, that has done well. Whereas here, people don't really want to do that. So until we change that, I don't think we're ever going to particularly catch up. So the, there's, there is investment there. There is definitely talent. We just have to push for sport becoming something that is important. And I, and I personally think it's hugely important, not just for going on to win World Cups, Olympics, etc., just for your general health and body and well-being. I think sport is hugely important and needs to be championed more. Perfect. Next question. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you very much as well for, for your words. Um, I was wondering, given that Olympics are famous for great champions, but also sometimes incredible records, given that uh, Michael Johnson's 
record, for example, in Rio was broken by Van Niekerk and it could have stood for another decade or two or so. Or so. Um, how far do you think someone can long jump? Oof. What is the uh, limit? No, it's, it's, it's a good question. Um, I think in every event, Wade, obviously in the four now, has become a Usain Bolt-esque person. So he's gone and done something to the 400 meter world record, which was unbelievable. And any of you that got to see it, I was in the stadium that night as well, to win by that margin as well was just incredible. And probably for me, the moment of, of the track and field, the Olympics, second and none. Um, and I believe within the long jump, there will be a person that is like that. I think the person that is generally considered to have been the person of long jump, uh, I'm not a massive fan of his. Um, and I think possibly he got there through artificial means. Um, so I'm waiting for the person who is the ultimate specimen who can come in and break the nine meter barrier. And it will happen one day. I'd love to think it will happen within my lifetime or within at least the next 20, 25 years or so. Um, but it, it, these freaks are there, and I call him freak in the nicest way. You're saying Bolt was a freak, obviously. I mean, like, he's unbelievable. Wade is a freak. I mean, like, he can do things that you just feel like, how on earth do these people do it? And, and that will happen in every event. And eventually, I think we'll, we'll have world records that are truly unbelievable. And they're pretty unbelievable in, in some of the events now. Um, but there will always be that guy that comes out, and he and she will be so, so much genetically better than everybody else. They will do something ridiculous. Thank you. One more question. Um, yes, can we go all the way to the back, just on this side? I mean, no rush, by the way, if you want to. I don't think ask. Thanks very much for your talk. I found that really interesting. Um, so just for a very, very, very unpolitical question, <laughs> as, you <laughs> as you asked for, um, did you get your misspelt tattoo corrected? <laughs> and who was responsible for the misspelling? Uh, oh, dear. You must be one of very few people that, that, that saw that. I saw um, it before it was removed, yeah. He, uh, yeah, Mr. Letter, which was devastating. But thankfully, had Mr. Letter, not in a way that was detrimental, if that makes sense, because basically he'd just forgot, he'd forgotten to finish the tattoo opposed to um, making a huge mistake. So thankfully, he just put the letter in, so yes. It's, so it's very nice much. Correctly. It's fine now. Glad yeah, to hear yeah. It. <laughs> this is often often the problem, and and I've had a few tattoo horrors actually. Um, yeah, if you ever, I mean, some of you will have tattoos, some of you won't. Some of you are thinking about getting tattoos. Like, go and see someone who's very good, because I've seen some very <laughs> poor people. I have some awful pictures on my body, which I really wish weren't there. Um, so, forget all the sporting advice, <laughs> tattoo advice, far more important. <laughs> because it hurts getting them removed. Believe me, I've tried. Um, laser is not fun, so go to someone good. But yes, it's been repaired, thank you. <coughs> thank um, you. <laughs> and, and I'd like to think that's my favourite one and it looks good. Anyway, that's just me. Next question. <laughs> yeah, just, right, just over here. Perfect. Evening, Greg. Oh, um, yeah. Going back to the interactions within Team GB, uh, at the Rio Olympics, were there certain sports or athletes or teams of people that were really fun to be around and like, celebrate the events with or whether certain teams that kept themselves to themselves and like whether row is any fun or <laughs> interesting um it, it's a it's a funny mix actually you have different people from all the different sports some of them are, are big characters i wouldn't say there's a sport as such that aren't particularly fun i think it is always difficult i mean you have social groups here your friends you will spend more time with your friends than you will just a random person that is sitting in a room i mean it's the same thing in, in our sport the only difference is I guess we may have an idea of who that person is or what they've done or, or want to say well done to them um, if they have succeeded. Um, I've never really, I mean, I, I, I vaguely remember in 2006 at the Commonwealth Games uh, in Melbourne, there was an issue between uh, track and field and cycling where I think it was the cyclists were saying that we get too much press and don't win any medals. And that was the first and probably only time I'd ever, and it's arguably true at that Commonwealth Games, we didn't win many medals. Um, I think that was one of the only times I'd ever seen that as an entity, sort of two people, or two entities, I guess, going against each other. But no, generally it's, you have your social groups, you have your friends, people you'll talk to, sometimes you'll mingle. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to think. I mean, Pete Reed's quite a good guy. He goes, I just to see him ever so often. Like it's, it, it is bizarre. It's just, it's like you have a lot of acquaintances that you don't particularly spend any time with, apart from them when you're forced to in this bubble that is the Olympic Village. Um, 
and you just say a little hello. It's quite nice. It's quite pleasant. Thank you. Perfect. Next question. Uh, yeah, just fifth row over here. <coughs> um, so obviously within sport, people have genetic predispositions to being more suited to one event. But um, I was just wondering what your opinion was on, because um, in the Rio final, I think all the 800 meter final, all the women on the podium had elevated levels of testosterone, particularly Casta Semenya. I was just wondering what your opinion is on that. Yeah, I have to be very careful on this one, of course, as well, because there was a, a lot of press behind that and other athletes speaking out uh, in a way. I think it, it's, it's so difficult because <laughs> fundamentally as well, if you're born slightly different to other people, I, I think it's very hard for other people to tell you that you can and can't do something. You always have to weigh up against the level of what is fair for the mass and, and the other athletes in that way. And, and on one level, again, who are we to then say somebody that was born a different way shouldn't be allowed to do something. That's, that's always the issue you have. Um, and I think with Casta, we saw that obviously she went on to some form of uh, gene therapy or whatever it was to, to make sure that she suppressed um, some of her levels uh, in the build up to, to the Olympics. And she actually disappeared off the scene for a while, actually. Um, but I, it is very difficult. So I feel, obviously feel sorry for people that don't have that advantage, if you like, but as a human, is it an, an advantage <coughs> away from athletics? Um, for the rest of your life, maybe it's not particularly fun and it's not a wonderful thing to live with. I don't know, I'm obviously not in that position. Um, I don't think there's a simple answer for it. I don't think there's an easy way of making it a level playing field when it comes to that. Um, so it is hard. And I think we saw Lindsay Sharp, for example, spoke out ever so slightly about it. Didn't, I mean, didn't say that she disliked the people, but just asked for it to be fair and there'd be some level of, um, I, I guess, suppressing again of the other people. Um, and then there was quite bad repercussions for, for her, so especially via social media, etc. Um, so it is difficult. It's very, very difficult. And it, it's, you have to get to that moral ground where who is the person that can say, as I say, somebody can or can't do something. I, it's, it's a bit above my intellect, I think, in that way, and know-how. Um, and as I say, I, I think possibly I feel sorry for people that are in that position because I think it's, a, it's not a fun existence, especially when you're being attacked for what is fundamentally the, your natural position. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's too hard to give you a straight answer on that one. I'm sorry. But it's a great question as well. Really, it's good. Um, um, I think it's the same row. Just, yeah. Thanks, Greg, for your talk. Um, <coughs> I was just wondering, you've sort of named a few uh, activities that all involve moving fast in a horizontal direction, um, car surfing, <laughs> long jump. You say you might move on to sprinting. Um, I'm interested in what you will move on to when you retire um, and what thrill is going to replace moving fast in a horizontal direction for you. And <laughs> have you seen people around you, friends or colleagues who've gone through the process of retirement from professional sport and uh, does it scare you or do you have some, some preparation for it already and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. Yeah, it, it is worrying. Uh, do you know what, funny enough, something that I got from Strictly again that I realised that I think maybe I'd forgotten ever so slightly that I actually really enjoy performing and, and that's, that's a strange thing I guess because the one thing about the dancing show was that I didn't actually mind getting up and but even though I looked like a Wally, even though I was pretty rubbish at it, I didn't really mind getting out there. And actually when I was in the dance office, it's just a good example of it. I know I sh shouldn't really refer to it, especially in a sporting sense, but I found myself coming into my own every time that I was challenged. So when I had to do it again, or I, w I wasn't good enough on that night, there wasn't this, oh no, doom and gloom. It was a brilliant, yeah, I'm gonna go out and do it even better now. And that's what I've always had within my career. I've always enjoyed performing. I've enjoyed being in front of large crowds. Uh, I enjoy the doing something at a very high level. And you're right, I, I've, especially recently, because I know that the, the end is, is close. I've got to retire soon, I'm getting old. Um, what am I going to do? And look, I, I enjoy pushing myself very hard, for example, when I ski. Uh, I've skied for a very long time. And, and another sport doesn't particularly go hand in hand with um, with, with track and field. Actually, I don't know, none of, some of you may not have been out there, but I was out in um, Val Terenz recently, and there was, the la all of the Oxford and Cambridge, Cambridge guys were there, 
for a big party. It was about 3,000 students. I don't know if any of you were there for that. Um, and it was, it was quite a good laugh, actually. Um, but you, you, you guys you got quite heavy, actually, so I, we had to leave. But um, No, but there is that side of it. And, and I downhill mountain bike, I really enjoy that side of it as well. These are all things that, again, people always tell you, especially when you do sport, oh, you can't do them, or are you allowed to do them? Now, probably if I was in a team scenario, then no, they'd probably say you can't do that contract-wise. But f basically, as a, as a track and field athlete, I'm, I'm self-employed, really, so I can make those decisions. Um, and this is that that mix up of life and performance again. Having an enjoyment side of it, okay, yeah, it might be dangerous if I came off my bike or fell out of a turn or something doing the sports that I also enjoy, then okay, yeah, I could end my career. But equally, if I don't do those things, mentally for me, I get back into that place where I was not enjoying my life. So uh, that perfect balance is having that level of enjoyment. And when I do retire, I think I'll probably do more of that in order to keep that, that fear factor there. Because I do love that. It's, it's weird, it's mental, I guess, at times, but it's fun. For me, that's what fun is. Um, and I'd like to think as well, there'll be other opportunities um, w within the world of possibly TV and other things um, once I retire. I don't know, I mean, you, you guys can tell me. I mean, I, maybe I'll do a bit more after dinner speaking, but possibly it was awful. So you might just, <laughs> from your normal generic boring athlete, then probably not. But. Um, no, it, you have to see. I think as well in sport, until you actually say that you're going to retire, um, it's very difficult, especially for external sources to come in and, and create a path for you. <coughs> but I'll just ski more, basically. That's, just enjoy it even more, yeah. <laughs> Not becoming an MP? <laughs> <laughs> Don't quite think I have, but yeah, and else for that. That's fine. Next question. Yeah, just over there. Um, how, mu how do you reset mentally after a no jump and how much does sports psychology come into your training and preparation for a competition? Yeah, um, I don't see a sports psych at all. Um, I saw one once many years ago and, and again, not discrediting in any way, shape or form, but for me that, w that didn't work and I think I've been very lucky in my, my career and the way I approach things that I maintain a level of self-belief that no matter what happens, I'll always believe that it will be okay. And that's not just in track and field, that's like in my life. Like I, I take on huge amounts of risk no matter what it is because I just generally believe it will be fine. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. As I say, when I, I do the sports that are probably a bit more dangerous, I just always believe it will be all right. And, and that's, that's how I approach every jump that I do. I, at the end of the day as well, I've jumped so many times in my, in my life. I've done it a thousand million times, however many times I've done it, nothing actually changes when you get into a big stadium scenario. There's still a runway, in my case, it's still a sand pit, putting on the same spikes, wearing lycra shorts, as you do. Nothing changes. The only thing that, that changes is your perception of what you're about to do. So as long as you can control that, and I've been fortunate, as I say, in my career that I've tasted success, so I know I have the ability to do it, I just crack on with it, really. If I, and if I fail, I see that as, okay, that's a, that's a wasted opportunity, but I'll get it right on the next one. If I foul again, which I found myself in the Olympic final, uh, Olympic qualification, sorry, I very nearly didn't make the final in Rio. Uh, I think I was 11th to qualify because I fouled my first two rounds. Um, and all the pressure in the world, the defending champion is about to go out. That's just terrible. Um, but to me, I just said, well, I'll be fine. I'll just get it on this one. And I did a safe jump, made the final. Being blasé, I think, helps me hugely. I don't know if it helps everybody. It's probably maybe not the best way to be in life, but for me, being blasé about everything keeps me happy still, I think. But that'll probably run out at some point. When reality strikes and I'm no longer a long jumper, that's when maybe being blasé will have to stop. But it's worked this, this, sort of this far. <laughs> Perfect. And I have a question. Yeah, Redhead, right just across. <laughs> Hey, thank you again for your talk. I just wanted to ask, obviously being an international athlete, how do you find it is like interacting with other international athletes? Obviously your peers are no longer just in the UK anymore. Do you find that like the saying, it gets lonely at the top is quite true? Or do you find that you do get on with your international peers? No, do you know what? I get on with, with most actually. There's a few that always, personalities will clash no matter what you do. It doesn't matter if it's sport or business, whatever. It, there will always be personalities that clash. So I'm not friends with every one of my competitors. And often actually I found it quite difficult to get on with the, my British contingency because for whatever reason they just didn't particularly like me, it, it, it seemed. 
Um, you're probably going, oh, well, I know why. Um, but generally, some of my closest friends are other long jumpers, and these are guys that have, have beaten me, I've beaten them. But I think what's very, very important as well, and again, it's the, it is this mix of, of life performance and being happy when you're doing it, is having a level of separation when you're not doing it as well. So I could sit next to the, the guys who beat me in, in Rio, and it'd be absolutely fine. You put me on a, on a runway again, I want to beat them, and I'll do my hardest in order to beat them. But equally, we're sometimes out there for two hours. If you hate everybody around you, it becomes very tiring. So I have good conversations, we have a good laugh. Some guys, if, if you ever get to watch back the, the final in 2012, a guy called Michel Tineas, a uh, Swedish long jumper, a really close friend of mine. He wasn't in the top eight on his third round, jumped eight ten, and got into top eight. Actually missed out on a medal by one centimetre. Now that's truly brutal in, in the world of field events. Um, but I went running down, completely forgetting that obviously I'm in this competition at that point, to give him a hug and to celebrate with him because he'd now made the Olympic final. And that's, that's how it can be with people. I think that's how it should be. But when I step on the runway, when it's my 60 seconds to get ready to jump, I want to beat everybody, and I don't care if you're my friend, I'm there to beat you. Um, but the fact that I can turn that off, I think, is very important to actually have a generally rounded life and not be too obsessed. Thank you. Okay. I think this is all we have time for this afternoon. I would like to thank you once again thank for a fantastic talk and for coming thank to the Oxford